cosmos out of chaos. Trudeau. Yeah. Do you have feelings about Trudeau? I used to think he was really good looking, and like that's pretty much all I <laughs> all I considered. And then now I'm like, wow, you can have such an ugly black heart with yeah. such a good looking face. That's very well said. That's actually like he slid into office using his looks as PR, which is such a strange thing. When he got voted in, it seemed like all people wanted to talk about was how beautiful he was. Um, and then slowly through time, like that black heart revealed, like kind of started to and people were like huh and like, like the few corruption scandals he's so cute he would never <laughs> <laughs> and that's how he stole a lot of the hearts so like no i'm just gonna vote for this good looking man it's like really yeah yeah and he had his dad too like yeah. he leaned into his dad i don't know anything about so that. his dad was like a prime minister in the 70s um and trudeau was like a very like archetypal like hero of a politician like a people's man like so he mm -hmm. was like like, really, like, if anyone said, like, who was the best prime minister, so many people are drawn to him. Right. Um, and then his son, you know. It's quite the opposite. Raised yeah. in. Shit the bed. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. Like, his dad's no longer in his body. And I'm sure it's rolling over nonetheless, just being like, tyrant Trudeau, man. Like, it's crazy. Yeah, right? I'm pretty crazy. I don't know. <laughs> it's brutal to say tyrant, you know, but in a lot of ways, like it's, you know, it was a, it's been a real, it's been weird to be Canadian at this time in our lives and watching like the culture of, of what used to be known as like globally, like, cause we travel, like we're never in Canada and like globally, anywhere you go, you're like, oh, we're Canadian. People are like, oh, Canada, we love Trudeau. Canada. Yeah. Yeah. And I always took for granted the niceness factor, like, oh, everyone's so nice, you mm -hmm. know, and, but it's amazing how that can be a smokescreen for such treachery you know and so don't don't be seduced by nice and cute you know <laughs> yeah my god and now yeah. it's like we say we're from canada and, every, and people everyone's are like, reaction oh, is canada. like i'm so sorry like <laughs> and, you, and it happened quick like yeah. but then in canada people don't seem to like be aware that the reputation around the world has made the shift because mm -hmm. yeah he pays like the government pays for they subsidize a massive portion media. of the media yeah. so there's this weird echo chamber government to media to public back to government sure. and it just cycles through and then so like in canada unless you're really looking for it passively you just think like oh everything's great this mm -hmm. is how the world is you know the world still thinks like polite canadian this and this and this but mm -hmm. at the end of the day like mm -hmm. I don't know the shift it breaks my heart like well it's, it's just not canada it's globally there's a lot of that going around yeah, it's true right it's too super true mm -hmm. even and i mean you look at the the shift in everybody's reality and how everyone's moving even to austin right like we've we've seen from outside in there's like this exodus from different areas of california and new york the people coming into austin um have you i'm sure you have noticed that uh, yeah of course and i just Quite. want to say for the record i was pre-pandemic okay, okay. <laughs> we do that with costa rica too because yeah. like everyone's come to costa rica yeah. like we were pre before the yeah, exodus yeah right yeah so what brought you to austin then um oh, you know i i have to say i have a really great track record of pioneering cool spots i gotta say okay i gotta <laughs> say yourself. i mean in 99 i went to williamsburg before you know the mass Williamsburg yeah amazing. moved to, to Williamsburg I think I was like one of 10 people in Williamsburg with an ironic t-shirt <laughs> now like you can't throw a stone without hitting a hipster um so yeah I was early there and then um and then on the east side of LA Los Feliz I went there early as well and then Austin so if you want to go somewhere cool follow where <laughs> okay. I'm gonna live next <laughs> Pretty much. Well, that's where we are. Where yeah. are you going to live next? Where? No, I'm not leaving. <laughs> <laughs> this is my forever home. Is it? Yeah, I mean, I, I grew up in New York, and the fact that I'm saying this now is, is so foreign to my lips because I was a diehard New Yorker. My whole ego, my identity, everything was connected to being a New Yorker. You know, I'm like, yeah. fucking New York. Like, who wouldn't want that as a badge? Yeah. And now here I am in... Texas, which was like no-go land. It's like, right. yeah, all those hicks voting red. And then now here I am. And I got, not only did I move here, I got married here. And this is probably where I'm going to die. I mean, for sure. Wow. On this land, living this life, yes. 
That's huge. I mean, what you're doing with this land right now is so beautiful. Like, thank you so much for taking yeah. us on a little tour today and just showing cool. your vision. It's really beautiful, you know, just to see your vision with all of this and the permaculture and like this community energy that you want to create and just all the little inspirations that you have. Like, I can't wait to even come back here, hopefully maybe one day and just to see all of these beautiful creations of yours like poof, bloom it's, thank you thank you yeah i mean for now it is just a dream or m mostly just a dream um i figure if i just keep telling the story and i keep enlisting people to mm -hmm. share that dream with me and inviting people to contribute and participate um and share in the building of it then it will become one day um yeah and it's it's gonna definitely keep me busy for the foreseeable future so for me this is not only um, a home, but it's a lifestyle mm -hmm. and something that I can live into and be, f be fulfilled creatively and uh, feel like I have purpose and um, uh, it's going to be a place for my family to grow up, my, my yeah. kids one day, fingers crossed. Yeah. And then, yeah, I mean, pass down. And if I might just connect the whole circle, um, by the way, the sound is are the, the trees <laughs> tickling the, the tin roof of this, uh, whole, this. This is an old animal holding pen that we converted into a lounge. Um, That's cool. Yeah. But so I didn't grow up with my dad and I didn't have any, and I think this is probably a, um, it's, a it's, it's the true pandemic, uh, the epidemic of fatherlessness. Mm. Like most of my friends... Growing up in New York and other and other places didn't grow up with healthy male role models. And so that was something I was deeply craving. I never had a chance to go through that rite of passage of becoming a man myself. No one was there to teach me. So I learned from Hollywood. <laughs> like I learned how to be a man in Hollywood and that's how I ended up becoming, you know, the the douchebag that I that I was for so long playing this character on a show that basically embodied toxic masculinity. Um, we don't have to talk about that, but my point was that coming here, I have found such an amazing connection to older men, mm. uh, farmers and homesteaders who have taken me under their wing, and all they want is to be able to bestow their knowledge to another generation they they want to give their wisdom and i crave it so much to learn so it's such a, it's that like closing that gap mm -hmm. you know it's making that connection that i'd been missing and i feel like so many farmers are missing too because a lot of people don't imagine homesteading or farming as a career for them or what they right. want they're all striving for Hollywood or, mm -hmm. you know, a different yeah. way of life, a different kind of career or making a lot of money or being an entrepreneur or any number of things. So there's both um, an absence for the younger generation to take on right. those, those roles to create our food, to grow our food, to steward the land. And then there's also guys like me who are craving that mentorship. And so it's, it's been great. I have, I have now four or five adopted adopted grand grandpas what? <laughs> yeah i'm like will you be my grandpa oh and he's like gosh. okay come on you be my my grandson i'm like oh good thank you that's that's so interesting i've actually i've heard that a lot in, in canada too where i guess they say because the tech the technology that's come to the youth of like the kids of generations of farmers has sort of persuaded them that there's more quote unquote to them than taking on what their their parents or their grandparents did and continuing that sort of that legacy so in canada you see a lot of like even like the um like f the fruit area of, mm -hmm. of bc yeah. all of the farms have been sold off um because the kids left yeah. they went and did other things so yeah. that's really interesting it's a really natural fit mm -hmm. for someone like yourself to come in and, and, and everything's being mechanized and and you know they're, they're like big factory style farms um for 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 animal uh, livestock as well as food production, yeah. and it and that's when you get into the gnarly uh, you know pesticides and herbicides and chemical fertilizers and all that stuff. And that's I think one of the issues with our food production right now is it's it's you, you we've lost that intimacy mm -hmm. and that connection to the farmer. Yeah, 
the the person who who understands and is in flow and in and in relation to the natural land. So I'm really excited about the um, the burgeoning excitement around permaculture and people coming back to the land and mm-hmm. learning to grow their own food. And obviously, there's a transition period because these are almost lost arts. Yeah. Um, but we have to preserve them and and get more people so we can have hyper localized food production and people can not only help to feed the world, take care of themselves, but also build that much needed nature connection because mm-hmm. we've become so isolated and disconnected from our, um, you know, our true, our true beingness, which is, I mean, we're emergent from nature. We come yeah. from nature. We've just forgotten. We are nature. Mm-hmm. We are nature. Right? That's so beautiful the way you see this now, because as you mentioned earlier, you said something like Hollywood raised you in a way, like brought you into this manhood. What a journey. How did you, like, what brought you to Hollywood? So you said you grew up in New York. What brought you Is that there? where you grew up? In I grew York? up in New York, yeah. yeah. No, I was always very leery of Hollywood. I didn't really want it, but it was the easy, easy route. Mm-hmm. You know, it was a line of least resistance. I made the most money and I had to do the least amount of work. Mm. And I didn't have any viable skills because I was kind of a, a rebel. Dropped out of school. What were you into? Punk rock. Like what? <laughs> well, like, I, you know. Let me light up. Oh, Mark, Did you see Mark's that? like a huge punk rocker here. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was more just, like, it's not, yeah, punk rock, sure, but just the punk mentality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. For sure. That's right. Really, um, yeah. Did you play in a band? Yeah, of course. Yeah. What was the band called? <laughs> oh, man. I'm all over Where, you the, now. Which band? The first one? <laughs> yeah, sure. Why not? Oh my God, the first band I was in was not punk rock, it was funk. Okay. Funk. Because of course, you know, when you, when you, when you learn that George Clinton is a thing and funkadelic is a style of music and you hear, uh, can you get to that for the first time? You're just like, oh my God, you can do this with music? I want to do that. So we were called UFOs. Nice. Unidentified funky organisms. (laughs) (laughs) All the acronyms of the 90s. When was this around? Yeah. Probably... I mean, I was like 15. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. So yeah. do the math. I don't know. I mean, I was. Yeah. It was That's. In early 90s. Okay. And then did it transition into skateboarding and punk rock and like. I, I never got into skateboarding, although. Have you ever watched that movie, Kids? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So that was basically my life. Oh, my God. Um, it, you know, I, w- I knew all of those people. Those were real. Like, yeah, a lot Casper, of them, were, Casper and Telly, yeah, yeah, and, Telly and yeah, yeah. I'm, so they, they were, they were actors, but they were also real wow. street punks. So you were in that. I, I mean, I that was like my New York scene, yeah, right? For sure. So I yeah, hung out with those some of those guys, and then was afraid of some of them, and some of them I was like, I would never, you know, do what those guys are doing. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, that just that film really captures the milieu and the vibe of New yeah. York in the early '90s, oh growing God. up. I mean, and looking back at that, I was like, holy shit, no wonder I turned out the way I did. It was, it's, it was a pretty gnarly upbringing, you know, with yeah. just like no, no parental guidance. You know, right. my mom was working, my dad was ghosted and I was just, we were out in the streets. We would pound the fucking pavement. We would just yeah. hit the streets wow. and then find places to hang out and if it wasn't like breaking into an abandoned building or going into a park and like finding a weird, creepy part of the park where there's like bushes and no one can see you and you're basically sleeping in rat piss and like, it's just like, what are you doing? It's just, well, cause we wanted to just hang out and be yeah. together and there was no place to go in New York city. There's not a lot of space. Yeah, yeah. So kids, it is what it is. I must've rented that movie as a teenager, like more than any other movie. <laughs> And we romanticized it. So you lived the thing we romanticized. Right. And then parents were horrified. Like, oh my, this is terrible. And for us, it was just normal. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. 40 ounces and, you know, doing bad stuff. And this, look, teenagers are going to, you know, push the envelope. Yeah. Yeah. But in the city, it's just, I guess, a different vibe when, um, especially, yeah, I mean, in the 90s when I guess it was post- I guess they had the AIDS theme. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that came in. But I, I feel I remember the back dark. in the day when we when we watched that, um, we thought it was a little corny because the AIDS ep- epidemic had kind of 
we'd kind of gotten over it. Yeah, mm-hmm. totally. Yeah, you know, we had condoms and we had sex ed and we all knew how totally. to avoid AIDS, right? Mm-hmm. We can be responsible, but that was still, um, I guess, a, a conflict um, device. It was interesting in the script like that, I thought. Like, yeah. The director, though, I forget his name. I saw him. The Harmony? No. Um, oh. Not Harmony Corinne. He Because he did like Gummo and a few other films. That would be Harmony. I think so. And he was, and he had some. But he re- didn't direct that though. Didn't he? Oh, okay. I think he. Maybe it wasn't Gummo. Wrote it or something. I'm, I'm not remembering exactly. I don't know. It was like. Um, but Gummo is awesome. Yeah, yeah. I don't see. I don't know if you get canceled for saying that anymore. Like, I don't I think know. about all the movies I watched and loved, and how you would never be able to make them now. No, you would never be able to tell those no, stories. No, no, it's crazy, right? The cancel is a strong the force is in strong right now, maintaining yeah. culture these days. Yeah. Where I think that was like a fascinating time where that would end up on a blockbuster shelf, and you'd be like, "What's that?" And it would just rock my entire like reality because you're like that's art like yeah it's like it's there's realness to it all like, yeah it was really and cool. it was it was semi-docu style yeah totally know? it was like a reality show with a narrative woven into it somehow yeah, yeah, yeah. very inspiring for me certainly mm-hmm. as a filmmaker growing okay. up mm-hmm. yeah because yeah, you made a few movies yeah. and at, it, at the beginning i think we were looking into trying to sort of see the body of work that you've been a part mm-hmm. of and yeah the paparazzo no i've, I've i made about five or six Films, yeah. both as a director and producer. And, so, I mean... It's so, mostly documentaries, actually. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. And so when did this love for for film and TV start for you? Like, from an early age, as you were a punker? And, yeah, 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 yeah. For me, it was all about being independent and mm-hmm. doing it ourselves and pushing against the grain. And, you know, Hollywood was like a... a you know, it, this was before it was okay to be in a band and then like sell your music yes. to a commercial like right. we, you know we still had real values mm-hmm. you know and 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 so hollywood for me was just like a land of sellouts mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. i i was in a band that did one of a, the first sell to a yeah. oh henry commercial oh we don't got say, say it ain't so fucking crucified like yeah. crucified now it's Oh my oh, god! Get yours, yo. Make some money. Totally, totally. But back then, it was yeah. just like, the it was. It taught me a lot to do something like that. To step out and be like, well, fuck it. We'll take the money and do something good with it. And we did. Like we took the money. We bought a tour van. We went and like continued making our crap. Like it empowered us. But so this is an interesting point of conversation because at what point did those subtle decisions made across a generation mm-hmm. who decided, well, fuck it, I'm just going to sell out now. Get us to where we are, where everybody's a fucking sellout and everybody's looking to just make a buck and nothing is authentic. And and now we're all, we've all sold our souls on some level. Right. It's like almost like the last bastion of like ethical, Yeah, I mean, maybe maybe it's it was like flimsy at the time, but. Yeah, yeah. I just, I just wondered, like, did mm-hmm. did we start to sell ourselves more and more? It became easier and easier to just give give everything to corporations, and now everything's commercialized. Oh my god! Yeah, everything yeah. from our like politics being captured all the way down to the anything. Yeah, it started with you, man. I don't know. You fucking You're did o. it, Henry. Fucking, you were that the straw. Henry, the <laughs> old Henry Bar campaign. Oh my god, that's so funny. Dude, come on, cut to that right now. <laughs> Well, yeah. And so I used to, what I used to do, that this was the way I justified it. I used to do one for them, one for me. Yeah, yeah. One for them, okay. one for me. So I was like consciously selling out, rolling my eyes the whole time. And then I'd go do something indie, cool. Mm. And it would be a fucking pain in the ass. And it would always be like not exactly what I wanted because I didn't have enough money to do it. But before I got Entourage... I was on my way. I was in Mexico. I had $1,000 in the bank, and I was on my way to uh, Cuba. I was sneaking into Cuba to make a documentary about Cuban hip-hop. Wow. Wow. And this is before cell phones, before, like, barely, we had dial-up. So I was in the internet cafe, (laughs) and I get an email from my manager. He's like, oh, there's this show called Entourage. You're perfect for it. You should check it out. And I was like, yeah, I don't do TV. (laughs) <laughs> and he's and he's like emailing me. He's like, it's not TV, it's HBO. I was like, HBO, I don't have cable. 
You know, <laughs> <laughs> just like, basically I was just like, no, not doing it. And then he basically said, in like, in so many words, either come to audition or find another agent because I used to just blow off all the auditions because I was doing other things in all these indie projects. And so I ended up, I, I, I got it. I was like, okay, I can only turn my back on Hollywood so much before they'll just find another, you know, young pretty boy. Mm -hmm. So I was like, all right, I'm going to do it. So I e email him back. I'm like, can you send me a ticket? Cause I had no money. He's like, okay, you <laughs> loser. And I was like, and I need to sleep on your couch. He's like, yeah, yeah, I got you. <laughs> so my manager sent like basically flew me out to LA. I stayed on his couch and I ended up getting entourage mm -hmm. and never made the documentary that I oh. wanted to make about Cuban hip hop. But that just goes to show you the contrast. And, and like once I got that role, I signed a six year contract. Holy shit. It wasn't one O Henry yeah, no, contract. Right. It was like six years of selling out. And I was just like, okay, I'm in it. Here mm -hmm. I go. Wow. You know? How did you cope with that? Like, being coming from one place like i have very similar things that i went through but not on much the same level of heights like mm. i did a similar thing where a guy offered me a chance to be the bass player like to try out to be the bass player for avril lavigne and um i was running a record label an indie punk label i was like running Dude. a recording studio i love this guy doing <laughs> doing all the stuff right like in toronto like just like on you know, my like own, punk, like yeah. just being like yeah. being a scene guy, like, and I was like running, doing the thing, right? Yeah. And then same kind of story, really interesting. Like you can go tomorrow, I got a ticket for you. It's a thing, you know, there's this girl, she's, it's pop, it's not your world, but they really need a bass player. They need someone really cool. You're, you're going like, to bring the cool yeah, to the band. Yeah, totally, right? And I'm like, <laughs> I was always of the nature of being like, if you don't, I can't judge it until I see it, right? So right. I was like, fuck all right, I'll go, like, you know, whatever. Like, it'll be, it'll be interesting to explore. And of course, like Get the it. universe gives me the yeah. gig. And then you have the question, and I don't know if you had that moment of like, if I sign into this, this is like the optically to the world. To myself, I know what mm -hmm. I can do with it, but to the world, it's optically everything I'm not. And ultimately, like that was probably one of the hardest things I had to choose in life, which to most people, they're like, it's a gig with a giant pop star. Da, da, da. Like she wasn't anything yet, but like to all the to the rest of the world, they'd be like, "Why would you even? That, why would that be hard?" But coming from the ethical point, where it's becoming I was, less and less hard, right? Yeah. But so, how was it for you when you're like six year contract? Like that's that's a that's a big choice. Well, I, I was about twenty seven at the time, and I'd resisted and resisted for long enough that I knew, and there's part of me that was resisting because I didn't think that I had the the fortitude like the constitution to be able to resist the gnarly treachery of Hollywood, like mm -hmm. to walk through the, you know, the valley of death and survive it. I was like, I'm just not mature enough or I'm not self-aware enough. I'm not strong enough to make it through. So I resisted. But around that time I was like, you know what? I can do this and still come out relatively, yeah. hmm. you know, adjusted. Oh. Mm -hmm. I barely made it out, man. It was hard. It was hard. I barely just wow. in the nick of time made it out. Um, so I'd been wrestling with that for a long time. And um, in fact, I mean, this is a funny, I, I, I went there and you have to sign the contract that you're going to do it before you audition. Cause they don't want you to audition. Oh. Six years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Before you even get the part. Cause oh. they want you to promise you're going to do it. Cause they don't want to be like, yeah, you can do it. And then you have to negotiate. Then, then you have the leverage to right. negotiate yeah, yeah, yeah. or you say no. And now they've wasted all their time. So you have to say you're going to do it before they even audition you. So I was like in agreement. Wow. I was hanging out at my, my manager's office, you know, doing dial up. Cause I had, you know, nowhere to be. I didn't know anyone in LA. And he came in having gotten the call from the studio and he, and he, for the first time, this is the first person that ever called me by this name. He looked at me and he went, Vince, oh. he called me by, by that name. And I knew, <laughs> I knew I got it obviously. And I hung my head and I was oh. like, fuck, fuck. Cause I knew that this was going to be a long term. I knew it was going to be big. I knew it was going to be a thing. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I, my whole life's going to change. I'm not, I'm not going to Cuba now to make the film. I, I got to probably live in LA or something, fucking LA. And I'm fucking diehard New Yorker street rat, fucking 
practically from the movie Kids. And now here I am in LA about to do six years on a show, you know, about like superficial things like chasing chicks and like, you know, buying fancy cars, which I wasn't into because mm-hmm. I was like a proper indie kid. Right. Yeah. So it didn't reflect my values. If I felt a little misogynistic about it, but I'm an actor. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, here I go. Like, mm-hmm. how do I, how do I scrub my soul to find the parts of me that are the character? Mm-hmm. And how do I make him as authentic to me as possible? So I found, I, f- I found that character in me. And by the way, we have all of those bits and pieces within us, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, we course. have the good, the bad, the ugly, and I made a version of me that was Vince and it was very authentic. And the more I played the role and the more popular the show got, mm-hmm. the more approval I got, the more money I made, the more attention I got, the more famous I was. And that felt good. And mm-hmm. I felt powerful and I didn't have my dad. And I didn't have that rite of passage to become a man. So that was me. Oh, now I'm I'm not a man. I'm not a divine expression of man. I'm the man. Wow. What up? Coming in and then wow. um, it gets really seductive and really enjoyable and fun and traveling the world and thinking that somehow all of my behavior is justified and I could do no wrong because you would walk into a room and you'd get approval mm-hmm. from, you know, three quarters of the people in there and because I'm making money, then that means that I must be on the right path. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize how far off track I was for so long. Hi, I apologize for the interruption, but I just wanted to quickly come on here and say that if you're enjoying this podcast right now, it would mean the world to us if you could just simply click that subscribe or follow button, whether that is on Spotify, Apple, or YouTube, or Rumble, wherever you're enjoying this episode today. By having your support, it really, really helps us rise to the top in the algorithm and truly helps us continue to do what we do with our beautiful team. So thank you so much. We hope you're enjoying this. Now back to the episode. Do you feel like this character that you had to embody to play for that many years, it kind of molded into who you were? Like, were there moments when you were like, who is this? Well, I mean, that's that's acting, right? I mean, mm-hmm. you're, you're embodying a part of yourself that is honest and true to that particular character. Mm -hmm. Um, And because the show, I mean, much like kids, it was filmed in a very docu-realistic style Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to the point where the audience really felt like they were connected to those characters. Mm -hmm. So unlike, I don't know, Game of Thrones, where you're like in some garb and then you go out and you're in normal street clothes. So there's a, you know, a little separation. This is like, and by the way, I would steal all of Vince's clothes too because it's like, oh, it fits me. And I'll just, you know, at the end of the season, I'd back up my car to the wardrobe trailer because they would just get rid of all of it and I'd just take all those clothes. (laughs) So I was becoming more and more the character and wearing the clothes on and off set and going to and and because it was a hollywood lifestyle and i was living in hollywood and it there the lines were very very blurry wow. and people would come up to me and they would f- it would feel like there's this familiarity mm-hmm. Vince, like oh my god like we watch you on sundays we're and they'd it feel like we're friends right. and i felt good and i'm a social person so i'd be like hey man yeah cool and people would want to do shots and they'd want to go do they'd want you to be the character of course mm-hmm. cuz it made them feel recognized mm-hmm. in their life mm-hmm. And so the more approval I got, so I'd be like, oh, I can accommodate, you know, and then it becomes easier and easier just to be that, that guy and live that life. Mm-hmm. And what's the character? I, I've never seen Entourage, but I have an idea of what I have been aware of. Was it about somebody like growing through Hollywood? So were you, was there that arc to Vince or would, did Vince start as like a Vince up here and you, you sort of caught up to that? <clears throat> you haven't seen the show? No. <clears throat> Are you out of here? Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I envy you. Because now you get to watch the show. Oh, it, he pulls out a, like a... Here, here, here you go. Like, <laughs> let's take world. a break. Let's here. just binge. 100 episodes. <laughs> um, it's actually a really fun show. It's it's a lot of fun. It's it's It just melts in your mouth. It's um, There's short episodes and they go by really fast. So you can just watch 
dozens of them at a time. It was a good era of TV, like when TV was mm-hmm. really, like I remember yeah. people that were really into yeah. it. So it was like, that was the goal. And this is when Benji just started and people yeah. were Benji. DVDs were a the, thing the, and it was like Entourage. Was Entourage was not dropped all as a bu- bundle. Yeah, of course, mm-hmm. right? It was every Sunday mm-hmm. you'd, you'd have yeah. to get yeah. together with your friends. And I knew people who would not watch it so that they could watch five of them yeah. in a row. Oh, yeah. You yeah. know, they would hold out because they wanted to Binge have more than a that, half yeah. hour enjoyment. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so it's, for those of you who haven't, who haven't seen the show, and there is a generation, <laughs> a new generation is coming up mm-hmm. on the show. And I, you know, I feel a little responsible for all the people who want to be in Hollywood <laughs> and who want to be famous There's some and Carmen want there. to be an agent. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I take responsibility. <laughs> but it's basically, it's about uh, a guy who's a famous actor and he he's, he keeps it real because he brings all his friends and he mm-hmm. shares the lifestyle with his best friends. Mm-hmm. And his whole philosophy is this could all go away and we can, it's okay because we, we have each other and mm-hmm. we can always move back to Queens and, Fuck. you know, be, be homies. You so know? a lot of parallels, like New York guy. Yeah, yeah. Well, our the whole cast was from New York. Okay, mm-hmm. oh, that's which I think added to the chemistry. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we were all mm-hmm. East Coasters. I mean, not right. New York necessarily, but mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. New York and the tri-state area. Mm-hmm. Wow. Doesn't sound as sexy. The tri-state area. <laughs> yeah. I wonder, Adrian, did you have any real friends? Like, are there relationships that you like, continue hold on? Like in the group? No real friends. Um, in the in, the in entourage. The, yeah. Did we become friends? Yeah. Did are are you still seeing them? Is so, I I see those gentlemen like brothers, like mm-hmm. family. I don't see them, but I'm, I'm in you know like, forever bonded okay. and connected to them. Um, and it's actually it's funny. Uh, Jerry Ferrara and I have been, we've reconnected recently since the pandemic and. I, I wasn't expecting it, but we've really bonded over the past um, year or so um, over just perspectives on life mm-hmm. post-pandemic. Um, and I actually was thinking about uh, Kevin Connolly today. I was thinking about reaching out to them because they have a podcast and I haven't done the podcast. And I don't know if they still want me, but there was a time when they wanted me to do their podcast and I just wasn't I wasn't there mm-hmm. mentally. I wasn't ready to do that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I hope they I hope they forgive me, and I hope, uh, I hope I might be ready to do it now. That's cool. Yeah. No, I mean that must be like getting the band back together in a way, <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, maybe they'll do a reboot. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> oh, There's wow. A lot of rumors about that. So yeah, I mean, what about acting for you now? Like. Is this a part, like... Still a big we've part seen, of you? You've yeah. shared the vision, and we'll get into the vision here. This mm-hmm. is beautiful, what you're doing, and we're mm-hmm. so grateful to be, a, like, to come and witness what you're up to, but what part of you is still... Is, do you have a foot in, in that world, or have you... Like, what's the we've status We've seen you've done it? a little bit of here, like, some acting, right? Just in... Yeah. Um, so I, I went through a, quite a number of years of total restructuring of mm-hmm. my identity, who I am, like what my goals in life are. Um, and there was a point when I realized I did not want to act for money anymore. Mm. Mm. I didn't want to exploit my talents just to gain status and wealth. Yeah. And I realized that I'd, I'd done that for a number of years that I'd, um, you know, I'd done things that I didn't really feel right about. Mm-hmm. And this is going back to what we we're talking yeah. about. You know, I, I did the O. Henry's bars over and over again to the point where it was just easy. It was easier and easier just to, just to do it mm-hmm. where I didn't have any, um, any sense of self anymore. It was just simply to make the money. Mm-hmm. And so I had to stop that and yeah, get back on a different path. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, so yeah, I, I essentially um, told my agent, I was like, I'm only going to do things that are really aligned with where I am and what I'm doing right now. And it's it's hard because I'm on a farm and I'm trying to learn how to steward this land and mm-hmm. how many roles would, you know, reflect that. And also mm-hmm. if, if I do accept a role, 
it'll often take me off the farm for a mm-hmm. number of yeah. months. For sure. And the land needs me, you mm-hmm. know, it's like, the, and the land won't be happy if I'm not here to tend mm-hmm. to it. Right. And so I'm a little bit conflicted. Mm-hmm. And it, I imagine from what I experienced, like with Avril, like the scene, like Hollywood, like that is sort of a game and being there is sometimes essential. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. We're in not even in Austin. We're outside forty-five Austin, minutes outside. Yeah. yeah, you, yeah. I mean, there are a lot of people who are who want it more than you, yeah. right? Who, Oof. and so if you're trying to get roles, you have to fight for it. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't matter how famous you are. Now you're competing with other famous people mm-hmm. at that level to get the roles that you think you deserve. Mm-hmm. Now that you've, you know, made it to a certain state. So, um, yeah, you do have to be present. You have to be ready and you have to be willing to say yes in the moment when the opportunity arises. So it's a bit tricky. Mm -hmm. It is. Um, but we're also in a new media landscape. That's true. Mm -hmm. Um, I just actually accepted a role that's shooting in Austin. Oh, wow. And they're coming to shoot in Austin because they can, because Mm -hmm. of the format and the way they're doing it. Yeah. Um, for example, so it, it is possible. And also... Um, I, I really do believe that, uh, and it's one reason why I was always, I always gravitated towards documentaries is because there's something vital and important about, um, coming down to a more, um, stripped away, honest communication of, of content, like mm-hmm. media expression, mm-hmm. whereas when I go see films, I'm 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 not often inspired because I un- I understand the conceit, I understand the mechanism of how it's, you know, I understand how the camera works, how the shots are put together, I I, I see the script, so I'm the suspension of disbelief is limited. I don't get it as um, swept away in yeah. the story, right. but podcasts and. Um, documentaries and things that are a little bit more real and user generated, I think are really important and very vital. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of excited about that format. Um, They're they're a little bit more off the hip, a little bit Mm -hmm. more um, uh, raw. Yeah. So, yeah. That's really cool. But just to go back to your transition, right? So you had what the outside world would see everything you had the money you had the fame you had this hollywood life like what happened in your heart that just made you want to see your life in a different way and to shift yeah like something had you know i find that you know they always say like it's the dark night of the soul right there's like this moment where you're you might have everything from the outside world but deep down inside you feel empty was there a moment for you that happened oh yeah yeah. i I had years of this subtle you know almost imperceivable dread Mm. i was like something something's up like Mm. something's off i look around everything seems perfect i'm like wow like have everything but i just kept waiting for the other shoe to drop and Mm. i didn't know if it was going to be a death or illness or something bad was going to happen but things were too good and everything would like would just come to me you know, I was, I was, I'm a manifester. Um, and what, it, what I think the rock bottom was, that karmic, you know, wallop was my girlfriend dumping me. And she was walking out the door. I was like, what are you doing? You're crazy. You know, I, why would you leave me? I'm the, uh, look at all this stuff. I'm the best. Mm. And she was like, no, you're the worst. Actually, the, quite the opposite. Wow. And she essentially left me. How long were you guys together at that point? We were together for four years. Four years. Wow. Um, and she, she, she told me, I mean, she knew me so well. And I really thought we were going to be together for a long time and um, have kids. And mm-hmm. she was my partner. Um, but we were in a very liberal, open style long distance relationship mm-hmm. and it served me well because I didn't have to commit myself. It was easy. I could still continue to philander and do all sorts of things. And she was just over that lifestyle mm-hmm. and she wanted more of me. And 
even though I had all the freedom, I still was wanting, taking more. I was still selfish. I was still dis, you know, deceiving her and being dishonest and dishonest to myself as well. You know, when you mean dishonest, like just meaning that you were having other relationships or like well we were we were open you were open we were not we were not in a committed relationship Mm -hmm. so yeah i mean i i was partying allowed to but still there um i would withhold or hide from her because i knew that she wanted more of me right so i didn't even want to admit to her Mm -hmm. or admit to myself how i was behaving Mm -hmm. um because i had no boundaries it was just like total absolute debauchery and see the, the flies are they, they remember what a <laughs> shithead i was They're like <laughs> flying around me right now <laughs> um and i didn't even i didn't recognize it like mm-hmm. i didn't understand it i just thought absolute freedom you know le- and this is like coming from my new york days and also not having again strong yeah. male role models mm-hmm. to teach me how to be right and you know no excuses that's just you know part of the story and as she was leaving she left me with a list of things that i should probably take a look at if i you know if wow. i was wise that's nice of her i was <laughs> i was like okay all right you know what you're absolutely out of your fucking mind you don't know what you're talking about still i'm i was also older i was like you're just like you're just you haven't grown up yet you right. don't know i you know like i've been around the block i know how to do things and i took the list and i promised her that i would in earnest take a look i would i was like i really would mm-hmm. and as i started to look through the list i realized that in order for me to truly answer whether or not I was a piece of shit or if I was a narcissist or if I was any of these things, mm. I first had to, you know, cause I have a science mind. So I was like, I need a control because mm. mm. right now I'm in my own head. I'm, you know, in my own, um, bias. Mm. So I needed to start clearing away all of my habits and patterns and, and, and just totally change my lifestyle yeah. in order just to see if any of these were correct. It's almost like, um, elimination diet. Right or something like yeah, that, yeah, where sure. it's like, why am I? Why is my tum- stomach hurting? Well, I need to eliminate all the foods and then start introducing them one one by one. Mm-hmm. So I did. I eliminated everything. I like basically eliminated sex, eliminated alcohol, eliminated partying, eliminated the friends that I felt were maybe leading me astray, and started really getting down to earth and meditating. And then I started introducing. Well, let me just try a little sex, and I was just like, oh that was bad. That didn't work. Like, you know, instant karma. Like that mm-hmm. was a disaster. The, the the women I was choosing, the friends I was hanging out with, all of it was just mm. not working. And I suddenly was awakened, was, you know, a witnessing all the bad decisions I was making before, but now I was online, you know, mm. I was feeling, right. um, you know, cause I'd been out of my body for so right. long. I'd been high, I'd been like asleep and just like in- intoxicated that I didn't have any nuanced perception of the world. I didn't have any mm-hmm. intuition. So I had to bring all that back and start to feel and like ground myself and feel into my body. So that when I was making poor life choices, I was like, Ooh, that's hot. Like when the, f- yeah. when you're so desensitized, you can put your hand mm-hmm. in the flame and burn your hand off. So I started to feel the heat of my decisions and be like, Oh, I shouldn't do that. I shouldn't. You know, and that, and that just, I crawled my way back into self over two years. Um, this was still as you're shooting Entourage and part no, of no, like no, the no. Hollywood this scene. Is, or this, this, is, this was not too long ago. Uh, oh, okay. I was about 42. So this is maybe four or five years ago. Wow. Okay. Had anyone ever dumped yeah. you before? Yeah, but I, you know, it was like I moved on. Yeah. Like, okay, whatever. I, I got one significant. <sighs> She, she's my soulmate. Yeah. So she came to the, I mean, like, you know, to get woo for a second, I believe yeah. that we have a contract and she came here to fucking show myself to myself. Mm. Well, to have the significance to take you out of chaos and bring you to an elimination point. <laughs> but also the egoic state, powerful. like everything you're saying, it's like, because your ego was just like living it right mm. like you were just served like it captured your soul you, right yeah. like your soul was just buried down 
to me, that's kind of how I perceive yeah. it when you say it. It's like you have a lost complete connection with this intuition, with your true essence. Yeah. And this ego is just like, yeah, like loving it. And finally, someone just slapped it and it made you look at it. And that's really powerful. It's like you needed yeah. that. Wow. I, I, I call it like a, a cosmic bitch slap. Mm. She like this. I mean, and you haven't seen her, but she's, you know, she's a slight tiny girl but she is fucking powerful and she just mm. hit me so hard that like she i was like w awoken from mm. like yeah, yeah. a 30 year slumber wow. um enough to recognize that i was asleep at the wheel and i look in the rear view and i just see a wake of destruction i was like oh my god what have i done for the past 20 what have i been doing and i had to clamor my way crawl my way back out and um i did a lot of work a lot of work and i continued to stay you know like clean i guess mm -hmm. uh, i moved into a little camper on the east side of austin oh wow and that i little like camper back there yeah that one oh yeah. wow yeah and i lived there for a year yeah, and, yeah. and a psychic told me because i feel like your audience would appreciate the yes. the woo part so i'm gonna just Please go Lean in ahead. heavy on the woo. A psychic told me, she said, the reason why you've been, she, she said, you're, you're grounding yourself. You're so ungrounded and you've been grounding yourself through women. Mm. Like women are a direct line to the earth. Mm. And so you're finding grounding in women. And she's like, if you, she's like, what you need to do is get yourself in the soil. You need to put your hands in the oh, dirt. Wow. Wow. You know, you don't need women. You need to be on. The, mm -hmm. And, you know, it makes sense. Growing up in New York. Yeah. yeah. Uh, concrete. concrete. There's no jungle. There's no For earth. Sure. There's yeah. no soil. And and I needed that. Like my soul needed to be grounded. So I ended up uh, moving in my camper and starting a little garden. And I was like in the earth for a year. Well, And it was like, oh, it's like just such a relief. Th that camper is tiny. Yeah. <laughs> like. Um, I, we pulled up and I, Heidi was like, oh, it's a van. I was like, no, that's a camper. Um, that's really interesting. I mean, we were telling a story. We were on Justin Wren's podcast this morning. Um, and he was but asking you went us, in your basement, right? Yeah. And After was, you quit the band? I hadn't thought about this in, as a punishment. in years, right? So during the, the Avril... The, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. My it instinct comes. as an actor is if I hear <laughs> something, I'm like... I know, you're like on it, man. That's, well, because you can't use it. There he goes. I like that Robin's shooting it. So yeah, at least well, it's a, a cash. Do it's a like cutaway. Street of playing street hockey, you're like sexy car. truck. <laughs> <laughs> so so Justin pulled out this morning this story about a similar thing where I was caught in a chaos loop. You were yeah mm -hmm. hard, ego driven, um, from a, a feeling, um, and it's I, and I thought that was really interesting. You were talking about dread. And my feeling was like it was a, it was an uncomfort with being at the helm of the biggest pop star, like right next to her, like her sort of like like her big brother role, and like helping navigate and watching everything start spinning faster and faster and faster. You know, I went from a touring in a van to the next second, like you're at the MTV Video Awards, and like Jimmy Fallon's like imitating me on stage as the bass player with dreadlocks, like you know, or whatever. It was just like. It was a reality shift, right? And so, you know, I did this for quite some time, but the chaos of it, not, not feeling like I'm where I was supposed to be, my reaction was feed into the ego. Like, okay, well, that feels good over there, so I'm going to run that way because over here, my truth, like it felt terrible. Because yeah. there's uh, a lot of work over there. Oh, fuck. Yeah. A lot of processing to go through. Yeah. So similar, like it was all drugs. It was all, it, it was just like go, like run mm -hmm. in with that because that was where like the cure was to like at least the lose yourself was. in it to numb yeah. that voice mm -hmm. that's screaming mm -hmm. right and and so eventually enough was enough and through it all i just fucking pulled the plug like i was like i, I watch everyone change i watch avril shift um she was this little sister to me it was the best time of my life doing one of the best times of my life doing that with her but watching her shift and the fame which is as you've experienced a fucking very mm. deep sedative a drug that like i watched everyone around me change i felt myself change i was like okay how do i get out of this in a way that i can kind of do that Does you know that elimination work? diet mm. <laughs> I'm, i quit moved from la back to ajax ontario canada my mom's like your room's upstairs and i was like fuck no 
put a put a like literally a mattress in my basement. It wasn't a finished basement. It was like like boards, like mm -hmm. two by fours, like all that kind of stuff. And I put a computer next to it because I was gonna be. I'm coming back to my record level, so every day I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna sleep on this mattress and figure it out and come back to source and come back to self. And like hearing you say, like mm -hmm. you moved, like you were like. And mine is a very small dwarf in comparison to your story. And you moved into a trailer. <laughs> Like, what was that? Why? Yeah. Why a trailer? Like, what, what, where does that come from? Well, I had a house in Austin that I had bought, and um, I had a little backyard, and I had a trailer back there, you know, because everybody has trailers in Austin. That's a thing, eh? Yeah, <laughs> and I was renting out the house, but I had, so there's like a division, there's like the garage and the little piece of earth, and then the trailer, and I was like, I'm going to go in there, and I'm going to create a community garden. And I'm just going to do my work there. So I did. And I was living there and then the pandemic hit. Mm. So I was like, well, perfect. Actually, when the pandemic hit, I was like, yeah, I got this. Like I had already been doing enough work to, f to like be in myself and to like be calm and to be isolated yeah. that it was like, oh yeah, this is perfect. And I just used the pandemic to wait for instructions. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay. Everybody's running around like a chicken with their head cut off, freaking out, not knowing what to do. And I was just, okay, I'm just waiting for the download. Like, mm -hmm. what's next? Yeah. Um, it all started to become very clear. And um, so I moved, I moved there to continue my work. And then the pandemic, ha like, basically gave me permission to keep going. Yeah. And I think that's what the pandemic was. It was a call to action. Everybody... Slow the fuck down, yeah. you know, come back to self and reevaluate everything. Mm -hmm. mm. Like what did what, the work actually the look like? The process of your work that you had to do? Well, I mean, it was obviously meditation, mm -hmm. um, a lot of quieting of the mind. We've, I've already, you know, uh, pushed away, not pushed away, but cut out. Uh, lifestyle habits and escapes, parties, friends. Um, and then I started seeking new mentors, new mm -hmm. friends, people that I thought would uh, help me along this journey. And people who I, I, I saw were living a life that I think might reflect how I would want to be. Mm -hmm. And so started seeking them out and like asking if, they'd mentor me or if they had any advice or if they wanted to hang out a little bit. I, I started rock climbing. Oh, wow. Rock climbing was huge for me because it, because I was celibate and I wasn't drinking and I was like, oh, what am I going to do all day? And I was like, okay, I could rock climb for like several hours and be completely engaged yeah. and also be in my body, like physically, like, oh yeah. Oh, and present. Oh, Cause present. I mean, rock climbing, you can't be in somewhere else. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, ironically, I do believe that, even though it was really good for me, I think the universe wanted me even more on the ground. Like mm -hmm. it was like, you're, <laughs> you're still climbing, climbing away. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you're still That's climbing. Interesting. So I, actually I hurt myself. I was climbing and I, I split a tendon uh, on a, I like went for, I went to send it, you know, and then I was like fell and hit my ankle and I split an ankle tendon. Oh. So then I was really laid up. I was mm -hmm. literally in a cast in that camper. Wow. Like now I can't even move. Slow the wow. fuck down. Just slow the fuck <laughs> down. Like get on the earth. Get on the earth. Holy. And, and I, you know, and of course there was uh, books I read and lots of podcasts and, uh, and then plant medicines and retreats and, and, and journeys like mm -hmm. psychedelic journeys that um, were extremely powerful and helpful. I did uh, uh, um, shamanic breath work. I did past life regression therapy. Beautiful. I did all these things. And man, I mean, it was, it was quite a lot of uncovering, unearthing. Mm -hmm. Did you see anything in the past life regression? Because all of this was at age 42, right? Yep. yep. That's so interesting. Astrologically, that's a moment of breaking for most men because mm. it's a Saturn quarter mm. so it's like a karmic washing machine that turns everything around i mean you was it 40, 42, 42 for me, when yeah. you yeah when oh, you yeah. had xavier mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah 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 totally exactly that's that. wonderful so did you remember any past lives 
Yes, lots. Um, you know, I'll try and keep it as brief as possible, but I, I was, this was actually when I decided to quit acting mm. uh, formally, you know, as I'd been acting. Um, I, I did a, a shamanic breath regression session with a shaman. Very powerful. And, you know, I, I was breathing. I was like, okay, what is this? I don't know. And then I started channeling my female lineage, basically mm -hmm. tracing back like my mother and her mother and my grandmother, my great grandmother, wow. back to my Native American ancestors. And I was bawling, just bawling, mm -hmm. crying. I was witnessing them and picking up on their suffering, on their pain, on their, mm. um, you know, just like the sorrow, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, the collective grief within that female lineage. And it went all the way back to the animals and the earth itself. And I was crying for like an hour and a half for the earth and mm. for my female lineage and how like men weren't there for them and how, they they had to hold all of this um, by themselves and how they were suffered at the hands of men and, and like all this stuff. And it was very real to me. And I, I, I feel like it was true encoding that I was experiencing. Yeah. Um, and, and then afterwards I came out and I was recounting my experience to the shaman. And she said, she said, it's funny, like, um, you, you feel very feminine to me. She, she said, you feel like you are, you know, basically living out that lineage. Mm. And, th and here I was like in this journey to try and find what it, what like divine masculine was to me and not having had any m way to model what my, the, like the masculine for me was, except this, you know, these, these, these toxic womanizers that, or, or like people who are inappropriate sexually or devious, these men in, in society that were teaching me how to be a man. But yet my mother was the strong figure in my life. And so she really shaped me. So I realized I was very, like, my feminine was strong mm -hmm. and that's actually associated with creativity. So mm. I was out in Hollywood and I was allowing my femininity, my creativity, my e expressiveness uh, to, to, to work. Mm -hmm. And I realized that my masculine was, was diminished, weak and um, immature. And I had been sitting by watching as I exploited my feminine for money and power and fame. And so in that moment, it just like hit me. I was like, holy shit, like I've not been protecting myself. Yeah. And I, I basically have been prostituting myself out for money and fame. Wow. Like, <laughs> no joke. Wow. So I was like, that's gotta stop. Yeah. So I called my agent like an hour later and I was like, I started crying. I was like, I. She didn't understand. I said, like, why are you crying? I was like, you don't understand. I just <laughs> oh did regression God. therapy, like sh shaman. <laughs> I was like, but I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm not going to do that to myself and to the feminine aspect of myself. Wow. Um, and, you know, I don't know. I mean, it's, maybe that's like a, a story I'm putting onto it. But to me, it just like resonated so, so strong. That's no, that's And that's when I, when I started to like then have to find out like yeah. what that protector masculine within me mm -hmm. looks like so that I can, I can act and still, you know, express myself create creatively and, and like have that strong, powerful feminine within me, mm -hmm. but balanced also. Yeah. So as you're going through this transformative experience, like how were your friends in Hollywood and this past yeah, life, agent, as I like, would say, like, how did they feel and what was their reaction to your, transition like that well now we're deep pandemic at the time uh -huh. so everyone's like uh, okay he you know he lost it so <laughs> i guess fuck. you know and everybody's in isolation everybody's yeah. fucking so t to me i feel like on some level it was just like okay everybody's moving out and doing weird things and right. reevaluating. so um 
Yeah, but you know, what I found was I, I would go back to my friends and Zoom calls and whatever, mm-hmm. and, and I just didn't feel like we related anymore. Mm-hmm. Like, we, mm-hmm. we lost the touch. Of course. Yeah. And then it was totally, mm-hmm. they were just, the way they thought was just foreign to me. Mm-hmm. And I felt like an outsider. It's like, wow, we really, mm-hmm. I've changed. I've right. so changed. No, it's super interesting. Yeah. It, I think it's been, it was really hard on Julianne and I when... I mean, we shift not in any way like you, but we've shifted. We used to live in Toronto and and live in like the city life. And I think it was a similar thing for us where we felt like there was a shift in the way you could relate to people, like your values didn't align. Mm -hmm. Like there was just, there was just something and it's hard to explain. It's like an energetic disconnection that you felt, that we felt Mm -hmm. with a lot of our friends and for us, it meant we, at that time, we sold everything we owned. We got into a van and we drove off with our dog into like a freaking cabin off the grid in the mountains of BC. Like that was our escape, you know? Is that when you started the yoga thing? That was, we, that was kind of the... When be- we went all in. Yeah. We started we it a bridges. year before. Well, I definitely mm-hmm. did some yoga to you guys. Amazing. Oh. A few times. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's so cool. For us, it was, you know, burning the bridges in that way. To, so you can't return. So you can't return. And we just in. committed to it because in our hearts, it's also like a feeling like there was something more. And I think it's this deep burning in, in, in your heart and your soul that there is a greater purpose and a greater offering and service that we have to be doing on this time on earth and this very small time that we mm-hmm. have here. Um, which is so beautiful to witness your transformation too, because it's, it's, you had to go through this difficult purging oh God, and yeah. transformation to bring you back to who you are. Like, do you feel right now who you are? You're closer to who you were when you were a child, like to when you're growing up or completely? No, I, I don't. I feel no. like a man. a man. I feel like an adult responsible expression mm-hmm. of masculinity mm-hmm. and you know, it's not a posturing or a macho-ness yeah. or, you know, po- it's, it's, I'm here to, to do work and serve my wife, who, by the way, I don't know if I mentioned, I got back. I er- I won back. You mentioned that, yeah. So, yeah they should probably t- so tell, tell that part of the story. she was... So she dumped me. She's the one that dumped me. She dumped me. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a regular love story. Wow. Oh, so no, how did she, how did you come <laughs> back together? So I was in my camper uh-huh. and I was in the earth and um, I realized I was like, this is, I'm all in, like I'm doing this. Yeah. And I, I started getting more adept at, and better and better at resisting the temptations, you know, like I was a porn addict. I stopped porn. I stopped, mm-hmm. you know, full indulgence and I was celibate and I was even practicing semen retention and doing a lot of deep discipline work. Mm-hmm. Um, but I knew I didn't want to be alone. I didn't want to live for my, the rest of my life in a camper. I wanted yeah. to have family and I wanted mm-hmm. a relationship and I wanted children. And now I felt like I could actually give a child something and live for someone other than myself. That's so beautiful. And so I was like, I'm definitely all in on this nature-based, mm-hmm. heart-centered lifestyle but I need more than like this little patch of land. I had like basically a bed of vegetables. And I was like, I want to get a large piece of land and I want to live there and I want to create a community and I want to do the whole thing. And I was like, but if I want to do it with a partner and I don't want to get something and then bring a partner in, I want to have a partner and I want us both to choose together. Mm. Um, I knew that was very clear to me. And I also realized that I, I couldn't be in another, I couldn't be in a positive relationship until I found closure in my past relationship. Uh, otherwise, I'd just repeat the same mm-hmm. patterns. That I, had, I had to go back and I had to truly make amends. I had to heal with my ex, with, with mm-hmm. Jordan. Um, not to get back together with her, but right. just, you know, to close that chapter yeah. so that I could come into a new relationship totally clean. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I didn't have any baggage. And also so that she could move on. Mm-hmm. Of course. You know, and for the first time I was really truly understanding. I felt remorseful for, you know, what I'd put her through. And she wasn't talking to me. She like blocked on all the things, everything. <laughs> so I sent her an email. <laughs> I was like, listen, uh, 
I've changed, you know, like I'm totally different. Everything's, a lot of things are, 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 are different and I wanted to just find closure with you. And, and she, and I said, I, I want to get land. I want to start a family. And I know I can't do that until I find closure with you and, and find healing. And she goes, it's funny. I did an exercise last night where I drew all the things that I wanted to let go of. Mm -hmm. And this is what I drew. She sent me a picture and it was like, the world and then like me on top of the world and I'm like a little boy and I'm like holding a cell phone and I have like a gaggle of girls behind me and she's holding up the earth Wow. she's like this is what I'm letting go of and she's like I burned this pa paper and I was like okay she's like this is what I was calling in and she sends me a picture and it's like land and a farm and a river and you know animals and llamas and the whole thing and I was like yeah me too like great okay so She's like, yeah, but I need to feel you. I can't just over yeah. email. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, okay, well, let's get together and let's talk and let's heal. Mm -hmm. And like, I'm like all in. I got, I, you know, I will spare no expense. I have all the time. I quit my job. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm living in a camper, like whatever you need. I'll, like, yeah. She's like, okay, great. I moved to Lisbon. I was <laughs> like, oh, um, okay. She's like, good luck with that. They just banned American travel to Europe. Ugh. Enjoy. He said. And I was like, oh my God, how beautiful is this? <laughs> An adventure, a challenge, you know, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, like call to action. So I, I was like, okay. So I, um, I pulled all the strings I could. I did everything I could. And I ended up sneaking into Europe. Wow. Um, I mean, and, and I was, yeah, I mean, it was not easy. It was, I, I, it, and it, I almost didn't make it a few times, but I did end up sneaking in. Shh. <laughs> I snuck in through London and like some... Wow. Ended up landing in, in Lisbon in Portugal. And I spent two weeks with, with Jordan and we did a whole lot of healing, a lot of struggle. It was painful. And she was not... Plan she was planning on living in Lisbon indefinitely mm. but she was also looking to study chinese medicine and acupuncture and there are two schools that she applied to and one of them wasn't going to work for her and the other one was in austin and while i was there she got the letter that she no. was accepted wow Talk so about i was like divine i was like i mean maybe you know yeah, wow. so i you know I, I made sure that i wasn't going there with any expectations yeah mm -hmm. um but we found a lot of healing and then, I mean, we were just meant to be together. We fell in love again and um, she came to Austin and, and she got an Airbnb and I went to visit her and then I never left the Airbnb. You moved out of your camper? I was living in the fucking camper. I was like, this Airbnb is nice. Yeah. <laughs> and then we, um, we ended up finding this land together. Um, and everything has been in partnership. And then we got married in June. Wow. That's so yeah. beautiful. Wow. And now you have this vision and this land and. And just by the way you talk about everything, it truly find like, I feel like there's a sense of purpose that comes from your heart when you speak about this beautiful vision and even just the work that you started to do outside of this land with all these different mm. organizations. Yeah, you've, like, you've started really bringing purpose in. Yeah. Which is beautiful to mm -hmm. witness, I think. Yeah, thank you. Um, like the lonely whale is really incredible. Um, mm, and then, you. I mean, what about the space? You're, I saw the thing where, I don't know a lot about it, mm. but I was interested to just, and I know we're running out of time, but I want Worldview. Yeah, worldview. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what's your relationship to space? Well, ironically, my role at Worldview, which is a space tourism company, uh, and they use weather balloon technology uh, to bring humans to the stratosphere, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So, fucking cool, right? And they're... They're much cheaper than the competition. So the SpaceX and uh, Virgin One or whatever the, the other, the Virgin One, Virgin Galactic. Mm -hmm. um, they're all like upward almost a million dollars for a four or five minute wow. journey into space and then you're right back down. And they do that. Huh? They do that now. Oh yeah, they're doing it now. Wow. Yeah. A million no bucks. Tourism. Yeah. A cool mill. Give or Jeez. take. <laughs> give or take. And you're up there for three, four minutes. Wow. And then cool. you come back. 
Worldview actually uses balloon technology and you have, it's a much less expensive opportunity for more people and you go there for six, seven hours. You get to spend wow. in the stratosphere. I'm chilling up there. And so we really do believe that um, in order to cha you know, change the world, we need per like fundamental perspective shift mm -hmm. in how we see ourselves. And there's something called the overview effect. And when people visit space mm -hmm. and they look back and they peer down at borderless mm -hmm. earth, um, the fragile, you know, thin blue line of yeah. uh, the atmosphere, you start to recognize how fragile it is, how connected we are, you know, how we need each other and how we need to work together. So the idea is if we can bring more and more people up to space and inspire them, mm -hmm. then when they come back down to earth, and that's really what my role is as the chief earth advocate, I'm here to remind people that it's not about using technology to look up and leave and escape the planet. It's using technology to gain perspective hmm. and then come back down to earth, ground in, and then, and then apply what you've been inspired by. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, I saw a documentary once about astronauts that's who, it. Like it was like a complete, like shift. a complete yeah. unreversible shift. Yep. The minute they look down, because we're always looking up, or mm -hmm. so consumed in our own life. And I mean, it's a trans transformative experience. Yeah. I would imagine it's a peak transformative experience, and much like any other, um, you know, peak peak like experience, you know, hopefully we can use it as an opportunity to inspire people to. Uh, engage more and rediscover their relationship and their place here on earth mm -hmm. so that they can make you know the proper changes and do the, the work that needs to be done to heal the planet mm -hmm. so it's not just can we get off the planet and go colonize but can we actually be here now as well yeah. and and continue to work on the earth and take to care steward of the planet earth. that's yeah. right mm -hmm. were you yeah. into like the relationship of this like to space itself like were you into like, is that a thing for you? Like, meaning just like the stars, the cosmos, um, science fiction, like oh, anything yeah, I mean, in that of world? Of course. I mean, it's, yeah, I, th I mean, I think there is something about the cosmos that we obviously don't understand yet, that we don't have the perspective to understand. Um, but if you look at the building blocks of all existence, you know, there's, there's something to it. I mean, we, I look to nature to, inform the way I think about the world and the universe in terms of how it's designed. You know, mm -hmm. the system design of nature is, I think, probably similar, extrapolated out into the great deep, deep unknown. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so. This whole conversation about the cosmos and the space and kind of reconnecting back to the earth is truly seen in everything that you're really passionate about now, right? The uh, permaculture and the connection, getting dirty into the ground. Um, but maybe you can speak a little bit just for everyone listening and watching this of how can people now get involved behind a lot of the organizations that you're so passionate about? Yeah. Well, I would invite everyone to check out Earth Speed, which yes. is my channel, is my way of sharing what we're doing here. It's a lifestyle in the cadence of nature. So it's it really is um, a nature-based lifestyle where, you know, we we want to start to um, sow in and in, in embed into everything we do a reminder uh, that we are mm -hmm. na from nature, that we uh, are emergent from nature, and so can and also can we be self-reliant, self-sufficient? Can mm -hmm. we build the capacity to care for ourselves and care for each other? and um, protect ourselves from uncertainty. I, I do believe that the pandemic was a huge lesson that we need to come back to a simpler way of being and a more connected um, way of life with each other and nature. Yeah. We've been so isolated, so disconnected that we're getting sick. We're, um, we're so in our heads, we're so in our anxiety, we're, we're, too, we're so ambitious that we want to feel like we need to like grow and consume and accumulate, accumulate, accumulate. Um, but I do believe that there's a, a much more enriching 
uh, simple way of being in connection to one another and the earth. And so check out Earthspeed and you'll get a sense of mm -hmm. how we're doing it. And, <laughs> and we really are just, I, I mean, I'm an apprentice on the land. Mm -hmm. So you're learning with me. I grew up in New York. <laughs> I'm a city, I'm a street rat. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so yeah. now I'm out in the country. I'm a, <laughs> I'm a country rat. <laughs> and uh, just learning how to yeah. do all these things. And I think we can all uh, teach each other. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so that's really what it is, is just an expression of, learning and a desire to be closer to one another and the earth. That's so beautifully wow. said. Well, we'll definitely include all the links to all of your wonderful work and Earthspeed and everything in the description, all in the show notes, in the show notes so people will definitely have a way to yeah. really dive deep into everything that you're doing. So. Thank you. Thank you so much, yeah, Adrian. Yeah, Adrian, it's thank you. It's been such a wonderful Honestly. experience to just connect with you in this way. And we and appreciate it. open your heart this way, like, yeah. and it's thank really you. beautiful. Thank you so much for watching. We really hope you enjoyed this episode today. If you want to support the show in any way whatsoever, you can just follow and subscribe and ourselves and our whole team will be deeply, deeply grateful. And if you were touched in any way, also leaving us a review on Spotify or Apple would mean the world to us. And for Adrian, go check out his YouTube channel for Earth Speed. He's uh, creating content for the heart, from the heart, yes. from this day forward. Thank you guys so much. We'll see you soon. See you in the next episode.